From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers Insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the rant. It's just me and Fonseca today. Lanny is coming back from the wrestling, from the wrestling. So you're going to have to wait for your full report from the Big Ten wrestling. We'll try. Maybe, maybe at the end of the podcast, Brian and I will pretend we read something about it, try to feel, feel you what happened out there. But we're going to talk basketball, obviously, because that's the big story. A 65 53 loss to Northwestern, just a disp- dispiriting night. Another one, six out of eight losses, uh, games. It's Brian. I don't know really what what else is there to say. I mean, the team just looks broken, and and it's sad, you know, considering what this team was, where it was, how how high a level it was playing, you know, to, just to see another game where can't hit a shot, can't run an offense, sixteen turnovers, eleven missed free throws, even the defense late in the game, it, just an overall, you know, bad performance. Yeah, they they looked hopeless, and they've looked hopeless for quite some time now, and I just. You you got the sense when they got up ten three early, even then you just knew that it felt temporary. It felt like the shoe was just about to drop, and it did. Yeah, the offense was just tough to watch. A lot of guys drilling into the paint and having nowhere to go and dribbling back out, and the shot clock's winding down. Northwestern is a pretty good defense. They had Rutgers pretty well scouted. They double teamed Cliff really well. They really made life hard for Paul Mulcahy. But honestly, I, I they just looked out of gas just just nothing there offensively and i think i think Caleb, we're going to touch on this but Caleb mcconnell was refreshingly honest in his post game and said that you could play the greatest defense in the world yeah but if the ball's not going in the basket it, it doesn't matter and that's not something you usually hear from this program that's built off of defense and we'll say that you need to defend and defend i think he nailed, hit the nail on the head if you, he if you can't score points you can't win games of basketball. Yeah. And I give him a tremendous amount of credit. You know, it, it, it's not easy to, to to be in a position. It's your senior night, and you think this is going to be, you imagine this in your head was going to be a glorious moment that clinches an NCAA tournament bid, and this, it, you know, you're going out on top and you don't. Uh, and he still came into that interview session and was just refreshingly honest and, you know, laid it out there. The thing he said that I, that I loved, you know, like we're talking about the offense and, even Chris Collins, everyone has given this team the out about Mawat Mag's injury, and it's become the easy narrative about this team. Caleb McConnell says, you know, it's, it's his direct quote is, it's not like Mawat was lighting it up while he was here. You know, so you know, so you, you, even he's like, you know, look, it, it's more than just one guy. He, he just, and I really admire that. I thought he was, you know, I've, uh, he's been one of our favorite guys for a long time, but this was just a really good moment for him. And he's right. You know, it's it's not one guy. So here, here's my argument for why the Moat Mag injury was so crucial, uh, so so detrimental. And I know it's not that Moat was, you know, a first team All Big Ten player that was carrying this team on both ends, but he was one the glue that kind of put everything together. It feels like there's a lot of cracks on this team that he was just cleaning up. He was uh, in Big Ten play their most efficient scorer by far. He was shooting their best at two at two point percentage. He was becoming a decent three point shooter. Uh, he would attack the glass. He was great on the offensive glass, getting putbacks. He was great on the defensive glass as well. He was their second best defender. So while Caleb could take away the opposing team's best player, he could help and take away their second best player. He was very versatile. He led the press. He did so many different things. But beyond what he what they're missing without him is the fact they have no one that can come in and replace him. It's the lack of depth that is really indicting and that's really killing them without Moat Mag because there's no one... In in wait in waiting that could come in and fill in adequately. The, the drop off is is clear. I think the demarcation line between where this team was, you know, fighting for the second place in the Big Ten and a top four seed in the NCAA tournament to how they're playing now is clearly immediately after he got hurt. It, there's right. the distinction yeah. is, is very clear. I, I I think it's obvious that Watt Mag's absence is a big reason for that, and I think that the, it's just kind of snowballed. And I mean, to be in a position where you can even blow a 10 point lead in the last minute to the worst team in the Big Ten, says a lot. And I, I just don't think, you know, I guess, what do you, if Moat Mag was healthy, this is a hypothetical, can't answer. If he was healthy, how would they finish the season? Not two and six, I, that's for sure. That's not, not two and six, totally. Yeah. But, you know, 
I can I understand all you said. Everything you said is true, but it's just it just seems like is Mawat Mag injury the reason why Pomoke seems like he he's completely lost confidence? Is it the reason why that Cam Spencer took five shots last night? I mean, is the one guy who can hit an open shot? Like, why can't is he the reason why my Steve Peichel made what I can only describe as just a, a series of you know, amateurish coaching mistakes at the end of that Minnesota game. I mean, not pressuring the ball, bringing the ball up the court. They have five seconds left. There's things that happened in that game. The way that offense is playing, is that my what mag? The way that, you know, it seems like the only offense in the, in the second half against Northwestern was to hope that, you know, Derek Simpson can can dribble in against four guys and maybe maybe Cliff will get a rebound. I mean, that's that was the entire offense. Is that, is that my what mag? And I get it. Like, he was a very important player, but I just think, and, and it definitely had an impact. When he got hurt, my first reaction was that this team, its ceiling went from a second week in NCAA tournament team to, all right, let, let get into the tournament and maybe win a game. That's what I thought happened. I didn't think you'd fall off the cliff like this. No, I I, I totally agree there. Uh, that That's kind of what, what my perception was. Uh, again, he was shooting 55% on twos. He was shooting something like 37% on threes. And when you're a team that's as offensively challenged at Rutgers, you need guys who are able to score like that. Uh, he had that huge shot against Ohio State at the end. He was he'd hit occasional mid range shots. He'd finish at the rim. He'd get to the rim again. He added an element to that offense that they're missing. But to your point, uh, Cam Spencer taking five shots is tough. But when you're the opposing defense can essentially blanket him the whole game and force Rutgers to have uh, the four other guys beat them. No one can step up, like you said. Paul Mulcahy is he, he he's having one of the roughest stretches for a college basketball player I've ever seen. I mean, it, it's dispiriting watching him out there. He looks completely, has no confidence, hesitates every time he gets the ball, whether that's shooting in the perimeter, whether that's driving to the basket, which he did a little bit more of towards the end of the game, but it felt a little too too little too late. Caleb McConnell dealing with the back already was a bit of an offensively challenged player, now even more so. And Cliff Omori, he had a really tough time yesterday. Like I said, every time they doubled him, he had no way of, of passing out of that double team, and it led to, I don't have the stats in front of me, it felt like five or six turnovers, right? So just, yeah, there, there's nobody on that offense. And even, it, it's, I think it's unfair to put all the expectations of salvaging this offense on Derek Simpson, who is a freshman and is not ready. He's not ready. <laughs> of course ready. it is, yes. And he's not, he, he's not Jalen Hood Shafino. He's not a five-star freshman who he's not bright bryce sense of it's it's unfair and i don't think it's realistic to expect him to come in and score 20 points if he played 30 minutes right it was the only hope i mean if you're looking at it you're like all right what what's what's the only hope here that's what i that's i i just thought that at halftime like just you should bring this guy in and play and give him as many minutes as possible you know in the first four minutes of the the first four minutes of the second half where the predictable you know steve peichel sticking with his guys i'm gonna stick with my guys i and I, yeah okay great you stick with your guys and now you know, the, the seven point deficits and 11 point deficit. Okay. All right. Well, that didn't work. And I'm, I'm just, I just saying like, you, eventually you got to try something different, you know? And I, I, you're right. And he came in and he, he, he missed a bunch of shots too. And he, he, he shows that he's still got a lot of, he's got to work on his outside shot. He's got to get to develop some polish, but at least there was some, there was something there with him that you haven't seen with the rest of the team. And and this goes back. This is not, and I have wrote this in the column. This is not a Steve Peichel last eight games problem offensively for me. It's a Steve, it's a Steve Peichel last seven years problem offensively that I just, I think it's just become very clear that it just hasn't, that what that great he's been in, in six other areas of this program. This is one that is, has been subpar to say the least in offensive coaching. All right. So, so I would, I would, so on that, two things. The issue in, in both cases is just depth. There's no quality depth. They're a very top-heavy team, and that goes back to recruiting. They haven't been good. They haven't been good yeah. offensively because they haven't recruited talented players. When you have a program that's focused on defense, that you can, it's it's much easier to teach unskilled player to play hard on defense to know where to be and how to to defend. It's a lot harder to teach a kid who can't shoot to shoot, right? So the, the issue has been they haven't recruited enough talented offensive players, which makes it a lot harder to run a good offense when you don't have guys who can you know play offense. And then the depth, the rest of the bench, you, you you talk about shaking it up. Like they have no options behind Cliff. No options. I mean, of course, yeah, none. He played, yeah, he almost played the entire second half. Yeah. And he almost mm -hmm. has to because yep. the drop off when he's off the floor is, and it's not his fault. And I know we, we mentioned Antoine Wolfolk's foul issues, for example. That's not his fault. He's not ready to play. It's, his, it's, it's the staff's fault for not having an adequate replacement for Cliff and having to have a, a kid who we keep repeating is a converted tight end football recruit. Right. He shouldn't yeah. have to be the backup big. 
You know, of course. Yeah. And there's a lack of development of Dean Reaver, who probably shouldn't be the backup big anyway. He's probably more of a four. And uh, it, all those things are just compounding, you know, mixing to to this just 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 mess of of a end of the season. All right. So we both we all left them. Everybody, everyone I talked to left there last night feeling all right that that that's that looks like an NIT team. Um, you wake up this morning and lo and behold, a lot of the bracketologists say no. They're still in. I was stunned. I was surprised. Not stunned. I was surprised by that. Uh, the Athletic had him as an 11 seed. I didn't look at. All, I didn't look at all of them. But I think ESPN still had him in. Um, I didn't see with Jerry Palm. He he had him on the. He had him in Dayton already. So maybe he knocked them off. Um, you know the net rankings that dropped from 37 to 40, and 40 is still an at large range. That's still that's still a range where teams get in the NCAA tournament. Is this team? Is this team still in the position where? It's going to get in, you think? If they beat Michigan, I could certainly see them getting in. I think if they lose to Michigan in the, in, on Thursday in the Big Ten tournament, I just don't see how. I mean, everything's going against them. They're not a conference. A lot. The big reason their net is good is because they had a horrible non conference strict schedule and they just destroyed every bad team they played, right? right? Does the committee punish them for that? Does they say, all right, your net is only good because you beat Coppin State by 40 points in December? Which, look, again, other Big Ten teams, Iowa lost to a quad four opponent, Michigan lost to a quad four opponent. Beating these teams, it shouldn't be taken for granted. But, you know, when you have other teams in the field you're competing against who have big non-conference wins on neutral courts, on the road, that I think the non-conference schedule should be going against you because it should, the, the sport should encourage its teams to schedule hard in the non-conference. They have a bad road record. Uh, I think they're four and seven road neutral. They... Are two and six in their last eight games without Moat Mag, which there's no recency, there's no eye test officially in the committee, but they have to take that into account, especially if they're competing against another bubble team in Michigan, like right, and they lose to Michigan twice in the span of two weeks. Now, the entire issue is that you're leaving it in the hands of the committee. Last year, they were in the hands of the committee. I think a lot of us thought they were going to make it. I certainly didn't think they were going to squeeze in because of all the issues in the resume, and they made it in. Are you going to get lucky twice and and? Have everything work out at the end of last week? Are all these bubble teams going to collapse in conference tournaments? Are all these bid stealers just not going to happen and all these tournaments going to go chalk? That's kind of the, what you have to hope for if you're Rutgers. And you have to hope that Wisconsin doesn't make a run. You have to hope that Michigan doesn't make a run. Uh, you have to have a lot of things go your way in the next week. And is it possible Rutgers makes the tournament? Yes. Do they even want to make the tournament? Should they even want to make the tournament, how they're playing? Uh, I guess you want to like get into the tournament, get that third straight bid, but... I just can't imagine you do anything productive if you get in there. Yeah, I, I see. It's funny. I thought the exact opposite. I thought they were going to make it last year because of what happened at the end of the year. Like it was, when they're beating, when you're going on this run and you're beating a bunch of ranked teams and you look the part. Like I know, I get it. Like I understand that the committee's looking at metrics, but they got to have television sets too, right? And they've got to see the results and they've got to know like, all right, you're putting in a team that at least looks like it deserves to be there. This team does not. I mean, that, that's the that's the flip point of it. No matter what the metrics tell you, if, if you've looked at recent results, if you've looked at, you know, what this team has been without Mag, you, it's really hard to say, oh yeah, of course they're one of the best. But how many, have 38 at large teams now? You got, you got to put them in. Um, that's the problem I have with it. And I, I don't know. And I guess I'm, maybe I'm crazy. I don't know what beating Michigan, Michigan solves it. You're being a 17, 14 team. All right. I mean, if you beat Purdue in the next game, certainly, but I'd like, does, does that really change the dynamic? If, if you get a slug, if you slug one out in Chicago at noon on a Thursday, does the committee even look at the big, the tournaments anymore? I, there's a lot of evidence that they don't look at the results based on teams that have gone deep in the tournaments and still didn't get bids. So I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's where yeah. the Michigan thing is you eliminate Michigan. So that's one less team you're competing against for True. for a bit on, on a really weak bubble. I know we hear the bubbles weak every year. I think the that there is a case to be made that this is a particularly weak bubble. Um but yeah, I, I think you make a fair point. I think beating Purdue in the quarterfinals would really like you'd be in. Yeah, that's it. You're in. Yeah. But the, the, the flip side of that is they'd have to beat Purdue, who I mean is really good. Yeah. Despite the fact they've been less than superhuman recently, they haven't been on a tear like they were early in the season, but they still have Zach Eady and they still have a lot of talent and Rutgers has not been playing well. It's uh, it, it's starting to feel like an IT. And, 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 and I, I will say this, a couple of readers pointed out like, all right, well, so you're telling me if you had, you know, if you had told me 
four years ago that we'd have two NCAA bids and then we'd be in the NIT, you probably would have signed for it at Rutgers. You know, you're not you're not in the position yet where this program, the expectation, the, the you're, you're sitting there like you're Duke and thinking, well, we've got to be in the tournament. We're Rutgers. No, of course not. I, I get that. I guess just because you were in the tournament, it seemed like such a foregone conclusion in just a month ago. Like it would it'd be impossible not to get in that it's it, it making it more shocking. I mean, is it, is it, do you think, is it necessarily a disappointing season if they get in the NIT? Is that, I mean, does that, can what happen where this team, where this program is? Should we be looking at it as just a complete flop? Yes, only because of the fact that, like you said, they had it in hand. They were eight and four in the Big Ten at one point. They won all their non conference games they had to, aside from Temple and Seton Hall, I guess. And they were in tremendous position. Like you said, I was fully convicted this was a second weekend team. I was counting, looking to it bracket, bracketology, if they can get a top four seed to be in Albany, I thought they could, you know, play the Sweet 16 at Madison Square Garden again, right? Right, right. When you're at that position, I understand preseason, everyone signs up for the NIT. It's supposed to be a rebuilding year. You lose two of your program grades. You're not sure where the direction of the program grows, but expectations shift with results. When you beat the best team in the league by a mile, on the road at one of yeah, the toughest road yeah. venues in the country. And then you follow that up with beating the second place team in the league on the road. And you're eight and four, you're competing for a top two spot. People should expect you to make the tournament. I guess you can give them a mulligan because of what happened, this catastrophic injury, et cetera. But I think, look, you've been here longer than I have. The, my real Rutgers basketball perspective has been the Steve Peichel era. I can't imagine there's been a bigger, more epic collapse at the end of a season than what we're seeing here. You're gonna get like six. You're gonna get like six emails about you don't remember the 1972 Scarlet Knights, Brian. I, I, I'm kidding, guy. But obviously, yeah, it's been a long history of 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 things that have gone gone horribly wrong. So I'm, I'm there could be one. I don't know. It's a great question. I know they've been close a couple of times. I mean, during a, people look back to the Gary Waters era, there was a team there that I think people thought would have had a very good chance to get to the NCAA's. It certainly wasn't a collapse like this, though. You're right. Um, that's a great point. Yeah. And, and it's good. It does stain. I mean, it does, you know, you had a chance to pretty firmly establish the narrative that direction, that the direction of this program was only heading up, you know, now you put an NIT there, you put this, you put this collapse here at the end of the season. And I think, you know, I, I get it. People, people at Rutgers don't want to hear this, but it, you know, that, that changes the national dialogue a little bit on this team. You know, you suddenly, all right, suddenly this thing, this team's taken a step back. Now you can argue it was a natural step back. You can argue that it was due to a, a bad break. It still is one, you know, and I, and I think considering where it was, uh, all the momentum in its favor, it, yeah, it's disappointing. Is it, is it, is it a total flop? No. I mean, look, I mean, look at some of the teams out there. And I wrote this in my column today. I mean, North Carolina is the number one team in the country and they're, they're, they're in the NIT. I mean, this college basketball is crazy. <laughs> it's just, it really is. So I don't think you can call it a complete flop. This is still Rutgers. This is still a program developing. It's obvious that, you know, while Steve Peichel is recruiting at a high level now, he hadn't been uh, in a couple of years prior. And that's, and those are the kids that are, that are on the bench that you just talked about. So, yeah, I, I I understand what you're saying, and I, I it is a disappointment, but a total flop, I think, is 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 too too harsh. Sure, sure, I would not call it a flop. Again, um, it's a collapse. It's just a collapse, and I I don't think the the perception issue is not really. It's the lack of a. The bigger thing to me is the lack of a, being able to build on this in the sense that you make it to a third straight NCAA tournament. That's a good headline. First time in program history making it yep. to the third straight. You have a chance of. I mean, once you're in there, who knows? You kind of make a run maybe, you know, and that's really all people remember. Last year, Michigan, I think, I mean, North Carolina, to your point, North Carolina was an awful team last year. They had a horrible season, regular season. They made it to the tournament and they made the final, they made it to the national championship game, right? Right. So they, if they don't make the tournament, which again, it seems likely they won't, they miss an opportunity to uh, grab some positive headlines and build on that momentum. I don't think that this collapse will hurt them in any tangible way in the future. I don't think any recruits are going to hold this against them. I don't think any of their commits are going to decommit because of this. I don't think any of that is going to happen. I just think that it's a missed opportunity to build even more momentum on top of what they had and uh, ease some questions because now I think if you don't make the tournament, the off season, there's going to be a lot of questions about what this program is, where they are in their rebuild and just a lot less stable than maybe they would have been if people, if they had made the tournament. All right, let's, <clears throat> I'm going to dive into insider questions. We're going to skip true or false because it's just you. So that's no fun. 
Uh, and we just got a lot of questions, good questions from our insiders, uh, NJ.com insider, uh, just, um, really a lot of good topics and a lot of frustration, a lot of people who've been around a while who I think kind of have, have a broader perspective. The most common question I got was, was about Steve Peichel's coaching and Steve Peichel's offense that we got today. And some, some of them were great. Someone, someone, uh, forgive me, I forget who it was, but someone texted, uh, could you please break down this video of Steve Peichel's offense? And it was, uh, it was a clip from Knicks versus the Fort Wayne Pistons from 1950. I got a good laugh out of that. That's funny. I like that. Gallows humor, people. Very funny. Good job by that. Someone else texted, how about Rutgers petitions the Big Ten in NCAA to install an expando basket on its uh, offensive end? Okay. Another good little good little jab. Uh, very blanket. Why doesn't Pike run an offense? Um, but this is the one I want to get to. And I want to see if you agree with this, this texter. Does an offensive coaching shakeup need to happen? I truly believe the issue is offensive talent, and I get Pikes is a loyal guy, but could this team be better situated with a real offensive mind on the coaching staff to get us to that next level? What do you think? I don't think it could hurt. I think, again, the bigger issue of all this is a lack of offensive talent. I think Acknowledging that, yeah, acknowledging that, absolutely, but... I think you have the greatest offensive coach in the history of basketball. I'm not sure he can squeeze much more out of this team, out of this roster. Uh, look, I guess, I guess who, who would you – you'd have to take out one of the assistant coaches, right? Uh, you'd have to tell one of them to move on. Right. And Pygold is obviously a very loyal guy. And, I mean, you have Brandon Knight who's recruiting at a very high level and is getting paid very handsomely to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, you have TJ Thompson who's recruiting very well and kind of uh, making a name for himself there. Um, you got Carl Hobbs, who's a guy who Pygold has had a relationship with for a long, long time. So you'd have he you'd have to ask him one to move on from one of those guys, which is uh, not an easy ask for a loyal guy like Pygold. And you have to find an offensive coach who'd want to come in and want to take over this this project, right? I, I just don't know. I, do I think it'd be a good idea to do it? I think so. I just don't think it's very realistic. And again, I think the bigger issue they have to solve that they are working on and getting better. Gavin Griffiths, uh, 23 signing, was at the game yesterday. I'm sure he would be pretty useful if they can get him out of the stands and into the onto the court. And they're getting Ace Bailey. But that 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 is the bigger issue uh, and more realistic path of fixing this offense than getting some offensive guru who I, I, I don't even know who this person would be if they're out there, if they'd be interested, et cetera. It's, it's, it's something that's not going to happen because all the things you said. And it's also not, you know, he's a loyal guy and – that's the kind of thing that happens when you're really desperate. Like this is the kind of thing that, it, that I think it happened in the football program where an, an AD says, Hey, look, you know, you gotta, we can't run this back next year. You got to do something. Uh, that's not going to happen here. I can assure you that that's that there there's Steve Pike going to make this decision. There's a million reasons to be confident in him. No one's going to tell him anything. And, and he's going to, he's going to stick with his guys. Uh, I will say this though. And it's interesting. Chris Collins is up there last night. In, in at the press conference, he's going to be the, probably the coach of the year. Team pick 13th, finished second. Great story. It's a guy who shook up his staff in the offseason. And I like, I don't like, I don't normally go into the weeds, but I was, I was talking to someone I know who follows the Big Ten really closely. And, you know, he brought in a guy, Chris Lowry, who's an assistant coach with a big defensive background. And all of a sudden, a team that wasn't great defensively uh, in the Big Ten you know, is, is playing at a high level defensively. And I, I don't know how much one assistant coach may, I, I, I don't know. I don't follow Northwestern closely. I just know that that's one of the narratives around that team. So it's not crazy to think that an assistant coach could have an impact, uh, someone who can bring a, a different set of eyes on things, you know, that that's, that's part of it. Yeah. You know, that, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't think there's any, uh, any chance that's going to happen. You make a fair point. I would push back and say that as you mentioned, Pykele is in a very, very stable situation. Chris Collins was on the hottest seat, maybe yeah. in high major basketball. So he really had no choice but to do that. Um, it worked out. It worked out. Um, but like we said, I don't think it's likely to happen at Rutgers. All right. A couple questions on in-game coaching. I understand all the reasons why Pykele is great from a big picture, high level program building perspective, but what gives with in-game? No movement, no offense, maddening sub patterns, and what seems like a pattern of late game meltdowns, Houston, UMass, Minnesota, Ohio state. How can this be fixed? It's a fascinating thing. And I don't, it, it's, it, it's worth remembering that he, he, he came here 
from Stony Brook with with a bit of that reputation, right? I mean, it's not, I don't know if it was fair or not. I didn't watch Stony Brook a lot. Um, but I will say the last few weeks, and that, and that Minnesota game really sticks out in my mind when, you know, when you looked at what happened there, yeah, players made decisions, player missed foul, foul shots. Uh, Cam, Cam Spencer jumped out of his shorts trying to, to block a three-pointer when he's had to put his arms up. I get like all this bad stuff happened, but there were just a couple of things basketball-wise that really stuck with me. Um, the substitution pattern, I don't think there's a good answer for it, but I certainly agree that that it's this has been a problem for weeks and you're still not overcoming it. So that's that's the coaching perspective. And what do you think about the in-game coaching? Is there a point to be made here? The substitution pattern issue goes back to the lack of depth. So it doesn't really matter who he subs out when. The fact is there's going to be a sizable drop-off no matter who he puts in, right? Um, in-game coaching, I know people have been talking about the pressing on the inbounding against Minnesota. Uh, so he, if you watch the video, he clearly is pointing towards his defenders to push up and press the ball. I don't know if they just didn't see him or chose not to do it. So I think he wanted to do that. They didn't do it, but he probably should have called a timeout maybe to set up the defense and tell them to do that. Obviously, the issue is that if they do call a timeout, they set up the defense, they let Minnesota set up their offense, they score, everyone's right. saying, why'd you call a timeout, et cetera. You could always judge these things in hindsight. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to wonder about that. I'm not in the meeting rooms. I don't know the coaching points, the in-game coaching, the execution versus bad coaching decisions. But it's, in a, it's, it's true that they've had a lot of late-game meltdowns, late-game collapses. You bring it up uh, at Stony Brook. He often had better, the best number one seed, number two seed in the America East and would lose in the final of the American East tournament and only made the NCAA tournament one time uh, when he probably had four or five NCAA tournament caliber teams. I don't know the answer to this. I just think it is certainly a fair thing to wonder and draw criticism to for sure. Yeah. And, but just, and also to be clear, the two things, one, he also erased a 19 point lead just, just last week. So give, give him credit for that. And, if you're being fair, I mean, I, 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 the number of headlines I've seen, you know, team a erases 14 point lead. It just, it happens a lot more than you think in college basketball, certainly not 10 points in 65 seconds. That is not what we're talking about, but there've been a lot of comebacks. There's a lot of, there's a lot of that going on in college basketball, a lot of crazy finishes. So it's not, it, it's not just the Rutgers thing. I get it that we're, it's right in front of us and we're, fr- and it's easy to get frustrated by it, but it's not just here. Sure. Um, I, I will say, Michigan had a worse meltdown against Iowa, but that's maybe the best offensive team in the Big Ten. Rutgers did it against Minnesota. Right. Um, and Purdue Absolutely. Purdue almost blew a 24-point lead to Illinois yesterday. They won, but they almost blew it. So, yeah, yeah I think you raise a fair point. It's just that you can't do it in that spot to that team. All also, right. the 19-point comeback, to yeah. come back from 19 points down, you got to be down 19 points, just saying. Good point there. All right. Alex from Free Wolf for Hill wants to talk about player development. Rutgers fan rave on the Pico player development, but without without much depth, how much accountability does the staff have? The lack of growth at the end of the bench. Uh good question. I mean, you got to give them credit. If you're going to do this game, okay, we've we've done this in the podcast before. If you're going to play this game, you've got to give them credit for guys like Geo Baker and Ron Harper and and Cliff Omori and a long list of guys who came here as developmental players and left here as much better players. So, I mean, I think I, just being completely fair, if you're going to judge him on Oscar Palmquist, or I don't even know who you're talking about, you know, I, you've got to, you've got to look at it both ways, right? Yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, this is just the issue of being a developmental program that they, they probably have a higher hit rate on these kids than a vast majority of college basketball program. Yep. The issue is that when, you know, of your 13 scholarships, 10 are developmental guys you're probably you're just naturally going to miss on a few of them and you can't really afford to miss on too many when that's the case. Right. So for you're going to have to probably have hit on two twice as many as you miss on. And when that doesn't happen, the results are pretty scary. All right. We have a question. Say no to NIT. Should Rutgers even accept the NIT bid? <laughs> Given how poorly they are playing, my concern would be losing badly, which could seriously hurt the perception of the program and recruiting. I don't think anybody would be watching at that point. Let's keep that in mind. If if NIT, yes, I think absolutely they should say yes to it. And as I tried to hint at the column and I was was being snarky, I know people love when I'm snarky, but um, there's some truth in the fact that when, you know, that there's there, NIT could be, you get a decent first round opponent. And if it's, if it's Seton Hall on the other side of the bracket, I don't know. It'd be a little juice there. I mean, it's not what you wanted. You wouldn't have signed up for that, but it's not. I mean, like it is entertainment, folks, right? I mean, like what else are we going to do here? We can't. It's. I'm not going to watch. I'm not going to do NFL draft previews. Come on. I mean, what else we got? What else do we got? 
I mean, they have plenty of reasons to do so. I mean, you're probably going to host an NIT game because you're going to sure, be a top you get, you get money too. Good point. Revenue. Get some revenue. Uh, you get, you. we talk about all these young guys in the, in the wings. You get them some experience. Get Derek Simpson some time to play in a meaningful postseason game. Uh, you you give them more, I mean, you give them more games to play. I, as much as the end of the season has been disappointing for Rutgers fans, I have to imagine they'd like to see their team play a little bit more. You give Caleb McConnell a chance to pass Eddie Jordan in the all-time steal a career steal record, which I, I, that's probably near the bottom of the list, but it, I think it'd be cool for people who watched mm-hmm. Caleb McConnell develop into what he is to be able to stamp his name in program on the program's all time list. And yeah, that, that scene hall game would be electric. I think sure. honestly, and then Vegas. Vegas, don't forget Vegas, the fi- semifinal, they get that far semifinals in Vegas. Good weekend in Vegas. Right. I got to give. no, sorry. You're good. Uh, last, there's a parallel to this last year. Xavier was 16 to five to start the year. They completely collapsed and went to the NIT and then they won the NIT. You know? Yes, so, and that would be a big positive if you could come out on on winning and make make the best out of a bad situation. Absolutely, yeah. sure. And also Vegas. I mentioned Vegas. NIT semifinals are in Vegas, so let's, and if let's they win the semifinal. They're in the final. That's another two days in Vegas. That's another two days in Vegas. And I got to give a shout out to my man Chris Eisman, who covers the the team excellently for for Gannett, New Jersey. And we're watching. We're in the we're in the uh, the box at the rack, and he's very invested in the Indiana Michigan game. And I'm not sure why. I understand it affects what's going on here with Rutgers. I'm not sure why. Come to figure out the man. And this is great. This is a man after my own heart. He he, he he realized he recognized that if Indiana won that game, Rutgers plays on noon on Thursday and not the late game on Thursday in the Big Ten tournament, which means we can get another good meal in Chicago. So that's you wonder what the rooting interest is sometimes, right? So a nice steak. little steak. Steakhouse. Yep. I'll make some reservations on that soon. All right. Uh, what else do we got here? We got, uh, so this is a question we talked, you, you mentioned it earlier, but it's uh, a reader wants to know, it seems like three things disappeared after the Michigan state win, Mawat mag defensive consistency and Paul's offensive confidence. That said, what do the last few weeks of the season look like? If Mawat does not get hurt, does Rutgers get the 2021 wins? Um, probably since D is their calling card and clearly sparks the offense discuss amongst yourselves. Um, I, yeah, I, I certainly think they beat Minnesota, <laughs> right? I mean, the very least you got one more win. You're probably in the tournament. I mean, do they, does it change the outcome in the Michigan game? I don't know. It was very lopsided Northwestern. Again, the team lost confidence. It spiraled, but somebody pointed out, and this is great. I've forgotten this. Rutgers was up on Illinois in that first road game, the first full game without mag. In the second half, before Illinois went on that nineteen over run, and that seems to be the point where things really start to collapse. Would would that have been different? Maybe. I mean, certainly. Uh, I I think they. Uh, you can even reverse it instead of going two and six. Maybe they go six and two. I certainly think they could compete for the number two seed in the Big Ten tournament. I think they do beat Minnesota. I think they probably beat Nebraska. I think they beat Michigan. I don't think they lose three straight home games by double digits. That's for sure. It's tough to know. You know, everything is kind of hypothetical here, but I certainly think they'd be better. And I think they'd be in position to, uh, as we've said a couple of times now, make a run to the second weekend. Right. All right. Great job, everyone, for the questions. And I appreciate you guys sticking with us after after uh, a di- disappointing end of the season. Not over yet. Disappointing um, a few cup a month for the season. All right. So we're going to try to at least give recap on wrestling. I read Pat Lanny's excellent coverage from uh, Ann Arbor, correct? Ann Arbor. <laughs> I read it so closely that I'm not sure where he was, but Ann Arbor, I'm pretty sure. Uh, seven national qualifiers. Goodell was happy with the battling on uh, the last day. A lot of guys fought back, uh, but 11th place is that strikes me as not good, um, especially when some of the programs that they're in the mix with simply do not pour the resources into this as Rutgers does. Uh, anything to add? Sure, I, I I totally agree. Uh, I think it's the second straight year they have seven guys qualify for the national tournament, which is good. Um, I just don't think they have many guys outside of Brian Saldano, who Lanny likes a lot and I think mm-hmm. sees a lot of potential in, that can really make any semblance of a run. So uh, that's disappointing for Rutgers, a program that's had a couple of hammers in the past couple of years in national and uh, Nick Suriano that did make a run and win national championship. So um, uh, obviously, I don't think expecting a national champion every year at Rutgers is very realistic. Uh, but I think the program is at a point now where finishing 11th in the Big Ten tournament, winning one dual meet, I think they won one dual meet in Big Ten mm-hmm. regular season play. Yep. I think those are well below reasonable expectations. And um, I think it's undoubtedly been a down year for Rutgers wrestling. I do love this. And th- this is a quote I pulled from from, from Scott Goodale. Um, People are going to criticize us. Let them criticize 
that means they care. That means their their expectations and they want us to win at a high level. We all want the same thing. That means we're doing something right. I just love that quote. Someone should hang it on the wall and a wall at, at, at the rack or wherever the hell they want to for you know the our our, our WJ Barnabas Center, whatever it is. They put put it someplace for for people to see because that is the that's the right attitude, totally. And yeah, this that that's a guy who took over a program, brought in some national championship wrestlers here, established a baseline for what success is, failed to meet it. And says, yeah, <laughs> all right, I did. Yeah, I, I just I just thought that was like, all right, good. Yeah. Well, so if you're a fan, you're, you're okay. Yeah, he's giving, he's, he, he's, he agrees with you. I, I thought that was just wonderful. I totally agree. And I, I'm not sure if it's the nature of the sport or if it's Goodale himself or probably a combination of the two, uh, but he's probably the realest coach. Uh, one of the realer coaches I've ever encountered. He'll tell you, tell it like it is. He'll be honest with you and. When when they have bad game, uh, bad moments like this, he'll he'll say it, uh, which is again very refreshing, and uh, always appreciated by us who encounter some people who sometimes really like to brush negatives under the the rug and uh, kind of truck along. So it's good to good to hear Goodale say that. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? B- baseball off to kind of a rocky start. Am I making it up? No, uh, it, it, Greensboro. It, yeah, baseball off to rocky start. Greensboro. Softball, Softball off to good start. Yeah. yeah there you go. The lacrosse. Solid start on both in both uh, both teams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, women's basketball season ended in a uh, ah, right. Big Ten tournament, but yeah. they did get a win. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we said a couple times, really exceeded expectations with this shorthanded roster. So uh, good first year for Cocos Washington, and she'll have to build off this momentum on the recruiting trail this summer, which um, I guess we'll be seeing. Absolutely. All right, let's sign off there. You got, if anybody's in uh, Chicago, come say hi to us uh, at the United Center. Me and Brian will be out there uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and who knows how long. Maybe this team will surprise us. Doesn't look great right now, but that's the wonderful that's the wonderful thing about postseason basketball. It doesn't have to. Uh, so we're going to sign off here. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks to Devco, and we'll be back in a week to talk about it all. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.